Hello? Hello? Hello out there. Welcome. Now I'm a little bit in the dark at the moment, but that's okay because today we're going to be talking about the deep sea. So friends, my name is Jen and welcome to another wonderful Aquarium Online Academy. Like I mentioned today, our topic is going to be about the deep sea, like what we have pictured back here, and also about bioluminescence. So I'm really excited to talk to you about the deep sea habitat and all of its fun critters that live within. And so with that, if you are interested in participating with us today, we would love to hear any kind of comments or questions that you might have and we'd be happy to pepper them into the class. So you can do so by contacting us right down below. You can go on ahead and text in at 562-286-1838 or you're more than welcome to email us down below. Now, uh, I also have some friends in the studio. I have Stacy that's showcasing the beautiful black screen behind me. I mean, the deep sea behind me. And I also have Talia who's going to be bringing in any kinds of questions or comments that you might have. Now for today, as I mentioned, our goal is to talk a little bit about the deep sea. So let's go on ahead and start here. Is there anything that you can think of or picture in your mind when you think of deep sea? Now, when I was talking to Stacy earlier, I think deep darkness, right? Where there's not any sunlight. So that was my inspiration here. But what do you think about? What kind of comes to mind when you think of deep sea? Do you think about, hmm, Maybe deep sea exploration. Or maybe you think about the wacky animals that live down there that may be really small or maybe have really cool squishy bodies or something, right? There's tons of different images that may come to mind when you think about the deep sea. Um, cold, maybe, uh, lots of pressure perhaps, or maybe different kinds of habitats or ecosystems, right? Maybe you think about mud. Maybe you think about whale falls or hydrothermal vents. There's so much to explore and say we're just going to be touching the very tip of that topic. So what do you think might be some of the struggles that the animals face living in an area that's deep, dark, full of pressure, right? What do you think? What kind of comes to mind? And here we have a nice little, well, picture of, of the deep sea floor, right? So in this case, not a whole lot that's going on, but you know what? Not the entire deep sea is a bustling city or, uh, or a lot of action, right? Sometimes it's just pure mud flats. Other times, there may be lots of ridges or underwater mountains. But regardless, many of these animals that live in these habitats have a similar struggle. Hmm. Have any of those struggles kind of come to mind yet? Hmm. I think I see Talia right in a way, so I look forward to hearing from you. But I do know that for me, some of the struggles that I think about is definitely that pressure, right? We don't, when we think about like the deep sea, large animals do not come to mind. Now in my head right now, I just pictured a large elephant that was swimming on through, which probably wouldn't be a real case, right? Um, but there are some large animals, like maybe a sperm whale that might go through or maybe a really large squid, right? But for the most part, on average, many of these animals are fairly small, right? Um, due to a lot of the pressure. Or, as this shows, it's creepy, it doesn't really have eyes, right? Or maybe the eyes that it does have might be more up towards the top of its head, too. Ooh, we did get some uh, observations in thinking that the deep sea um, is cold and that there are anglerfish in there, too. And we'll get to that friend in a minute. But absolutely, right? So they might have special features on them. Um, sometimes the color might not be anything exciting. Unless white's your favorite color, then it's really exciting, right? So many of the animals may lack pigment in them, um, but they're not always white. Sometimes they may be red, uh, sometimes, like our, our shrimp right here. So this red is basically an invisibility cloak as you don't really see red in this super deep ocean, right? So you may be red. You also might be purple too. So if white, red, or purple are one of your favorite colors, you are in luck because many of our animals are that color, like our bobtail squid right here. Ah, so cute. All right, friends, but you also mentioned anglerfish, right? And that one has some very specific adaptations too. Um, so with that fish, right, if you imagine, if you've ever seen like Finding Nemo or anything like that, right, we have a large, what seems kind of like a large fish. This one's a very cute one with a super pouty face. I love this one, right? Lots of different kinds of anglers out there, but the one feature that they all have, aside from a large mouth that's usually kind of pouty, 
is the angler on top. Angler or fishing rod, right? So this little part right here, it's tucked in right now, but can also be outwards, right? Some of them are out like this, and there's usually a lure at the end. Now that lure can look really different. Maybe it looks like that little puffball right there, which is very intriguing. Alternatively, it may kind of look like a, a glowing ball at the end, right? But if you think about it, what might be the purpose of that little fishing lure? Hmm. If you're thinking, well, to catch fish, yes, right? It's a great way to be able to catch their food. So that lure is just basically put out, and then an animal may get really interested in it, come on over to wanting to take a nibble, but instead, they are the one that gets nibbled, right? They get nibbled up by this mouth right here, which just sucks them right on in. So, unfortunately, the joke's on them, right? So these animals right here have incredible adaptations. That lure right there, that really large mouth, some anglers will have really large teeth too that kind of um, are curved inwards too to kind of make sure that that fish, right, that TC animal does not get away. Because do you think there's an abundant amount of food in the deep sea? Mm -mm, right? So that's another struggle. These animals have to find ways to be able to attract food where and when they can. Now luckily for them, because they live in a very deep and cold environment, most of the time their metabolisms are pretty slow. So there's that going for them too. Now this one also happens to be red, right? So it's a lovely camouflage right here and it has a nice rotund body. Um, I don't think that's due to its lack of us uh, or of its slow metabolism, but it's just naturally that shape as, as a whole, right? So these animals are really fascinating and they come in a whole bunch of different shapes and sizes depending upon where they live in the deep sea because the deep sea is an actual dynamic environment. Um, so thank you so very much for some of your, well, adaptations of these deep sea animals, right? They may have lack of eyes or maybe really big eyes, right? The colors may be different as we talked about. Maybe they won't want to have anything about pigments, uh, so they're white or maybe they're red or they're purple, so they're really hard to see. Um, I'm sorry, Talia? Ah, so we did get a question about why some of them don't have eyes. Well, if we think about the deep sea, is there a lot of light down there? Not so much. Remember how we started out in the dark, even though there was a light on me, right? But basically in the deep sea, there it's really deep dark and maybe they don't need eyes, right? They have developed and really kind of amplified their other senses in order to be able to, to really kind of work efficiently and live efficiently in that space. Since there is not a lot of light down there, some of them are like, you know what, I don't really need eyes. Or maybe, you know, they use their sense of smell. Uh, some of them may have, you know, electroreceptor senses in them, like some sharks do, to be able to kind of dig out where some of the food may be without even needing that light. So really kind of depends on the animal. So good question. Thank you for asking. Now, if we go on ahead and we delve a little bit deeper into these marine deep sea environments, they can be kind of muddy like this one, or they could be really dynamic like hydrothermal vents. Um, before I get into that, it looks like we have a handful of questions I wanna make sure we get to. What are some deep sea symbiotic relationships? That is a good question. Let's actually, you know what? Let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk a little bit about bioluminescence. In particular, let's go on ahead and uh, Look at the bobtail squid. So that cute little purple friend that was here. So in our oceans, right, um, within the very deep sea, we talked about there not being a whole lot of light, but there's something called bioluminescence. Have you heard of that word before? Think about, yeah, it's something that glows, right? And absolutely. In this case, a lot of times bioluminescence is living light, and that could be conjured up in several different ways. One way is if you imagine, let's just say like a glow stick, right? It doesn't glow right away, but once you crack it, then, and you mix it up, then it'll glow, right? Well, in many animals, they have kind of like a glow stick environment inside of them. Basically, there are two chemicals that come together, luciferin and luciferase, and with the presence of a little bit of oxygen, it mixes up and turns into light. Now, this light is so efficient that it actually burns cold, meaning that there is no heat that is emitted from the light which means that is extra efficient. If you think about our light bulbs around the house, right? Um, if we have to change it, you don't wanna to try to change a light bulb when it was just on, right? Cause it gets really hot. So a lot of that energy that's emitted by that light bulb 
basically ends up, well, being dispersed by heat. Well, in the ocean, they are so efficient that the light just kind of burns kind of cold, which is kind of cool, right? So there are many different strategies for using that um, bioluminescence. One special thing that is used, um, or one special way in which bioluminescence is used, is by our bobtail squid here. Now, Lucifer and Luciferase, that combo is one way, but this bobtail squid actually has a special symbiotic relationship with a bacteria called Vibrio fisheri. Yep, it has a bacteria that lives underneath the parts of the squid in little light sacs. Now, this cute little squid is actually a nocturnal animal, um, and so it sleeps during the day. Right now, it's on top of the sand. Sometimes they'll dig themselves underneath and put some sand on top so that way they can kind of sleep peacefully during the daytime and hide from any potential predators. But other than that, when this animal is ready to hunt at night, it elevates itself from the sand, and the bacteria that glow for this animal here starts to basically match the same light intensity of the sunlight. Oh, I'm sorry, of the moonlight. Now you're thinking, wait, we're talking about deep sea. But in this case, we're talking about special bioluminescent relationships. Now this bobtail squid actually lives in Hawaii. And the Hawaiian bobtail squid, even though it is deep, the water is really clear there. So a lot of that sunlight in that particular area can actually beam on down. Now, it may not be thousands of feet deep, right, but it's still pretty deep. And what this animal does is those bacteria blend in with the moonlight. And so if you have any critter that's down on the ground and they look up, they're not going to see the bobtail squid. Now, the squid's also only about like one inch long, so it's pretty small. Um, but the squid basically has an invisibility cloak and it's able to hover and match the moonlight exactly, and then it's able to sneak up on any food that it may eat. So sometimes like little shrimp and, and foods like that, maybe super small fish that it might be able to, to munch on. So it's a pretty incredible relationship that this bacteria happens to have with the squid. Now, kind of cool thing, because it is an invisibility cloak, the US Air Force is actually really interested in taking that bacteria relationship and how it's able to bounce against the moonlight into their aircrafts. Pretty amazing, right? I think so, at least. All right, we did get another question of, are there deep sea plants? Hmm. Now, if we think about it, what are some things that plants need to survive? If I think of my strawberry plant that I have, I've gotten only one strawberry so far, hoping to get more. I know that it needs sunlight. I know that it needs water. I also know that it needs a lot of like nutrients and, and it gets stuff from the soil. So those are things I need for land plants. Now, there aren't too many ocean plants. A lot of them are seagrasses that are ocean plants. And those seagrasses need the same thing that land plants do. So they need that sunlight, they need water, which they live in, but they also need those nutrients. Now we have seaweed, which kind of is similar. It's an algae, right? Um, and so they also have similar requirements. But if we think about super deep sea, do they get all those three things? Not so much, right? They're missing that sunlight. So in that case, it does make it really tricky, right? It really makes it really tricky for them to do any photosynthesis, which is major key for these plants to survive. But if we think about this, right, there are, if we think about on land, these plants are the basis of the food chain, right? Or at least part of the base of the entire food chain. Well, in the ocean, a lot of times those seagrasses, those algae are also the base of the food chain. But what about the deep sea? If they don't have that food chain, if they don't have that, how do you think they might eat? What's the basis of their food chain? Hmm. Well, chemicals. Yep. There's a lot of chemosynthesis that goes down down there instead. So as I mentioned before, I kind of want to touch a little bit about hydrothermal vents. And here is a picture of one here. And these vents are actually uh, basically areas where there is magma that's happened, that's kind of bubbling up underneath. And a lot of, oh, thank you, Stacy. A lot of the seawater is around it. And as the seawater and the minerals and uh, all of that kind of mixes together, you end up getting something like what you see here, a black smoker. So we have a whole bunch of chemicals that are being spewed up. And a lot of times in the case of a black smoker in particular, these are the hottest of the hydrothermal vents. And they also happen to have the darkest plumes. 
a lot of them are sulfur compounds that come out. Um, and these kind of rain down and snow down and create other kind of minerals and compounds. And that's pretty much what many of these animals, like worms that we have right here, tube worms, and they're able to utilize all of those minerals to be able to survive. So it's a completely wild and wacky area down there. Now, if it looks, we also have something that's called white smokers too. So there's several different varieties. And these white smokers are a little bit cooler. Um, these ones being close to 700, 750 degrees Fahrenheit. So they are really hot. Um, thinking about the average water temperature outside there, it's probably about, um, what, 100 times less. So it's much, it's maybe like seven, eight degrees. So it's much, much cooler. Um, maybe about like, yeah, thereabouts, maybe a little bit cooler. And so the water really gets, gets superheated in these areas. Uh, we did get some more questions asking about why aren't some deep sea animals affected by pressure? Aha, well that is because they are, they have built, they have built adaptations over time to be able to live in that kind of pressure environment. So if you think about it, right, a lot of them are going to be small, so that's kind of a way to kind of combat pressure, less surface area, you're not really huge and have to really battle the elements on every single end. Alternatively, you may have like a hard shell, right? So that might be really helpful too, like our crab. Small, but mighty, really tough, right? Um, you may also have a hard shell, calcium tube, kind of like these hydrothermal vents, right? Maybe you don't have very much structure at all. Maybe you just have some basic wispy parts, kind of like what we have right here with our uh, with our coral, right? There's lots of different ways to combat it. Sometimes you're really super skinny. Other times you may be really flat. So there are lots of different ways that these animals are able to kind of combat that pressure. Uh, we also got a question of how do these photos, how do we get these photos if pressure is bad, right? Now, pressure, there definitely is a lot of pressure, but for these animals, pressure is not bad. Pressure is their home. So I ask that question to all of you. How do you think they actually get these, get these pictures? Hmm. Definitely if a human, we're a little bit squishy. So it may be tricky for us to be able to go down there unless, unless we're in something hard like this crab, right? Maybe it might be a, um, like a submersible where we could go on ahead and jump on in with our pilot, right? And maybe one other person, but probably just the pilot. And we can head down into the deep sea, right? But the thing is, well, maybe I get really hungry, right? Maybe I can bring snacks, which is great. But what if I need to go to the bathroom? Or what if I'm really tired, right? Basically, there's limitations when there's people that can go in a submersible. It's great for some research, right? Um, but there's definitely limitations when humans are involved going down deep. Now, this also may not go down as deep as, let's just say, a remotely operated vehicle, which is one, as the name shows, right, is remote, meaning that you get to stay safe and sound and snug on a boat, maybe with a cup of hot cocoa, maybe with a delicious pastry on the side, and you can work with a team of scientists, right, um, that go on ahead and work together to create this, well, deep sea exploration. So basically on this side here is where we would have our remotely operated vehicle and you might be able to sit somewhere snug along here and you are going to basically be driving that vehicle underneath the water. Now there's an entire team that does this together, right? We have the ROV pilots that pilot these, but these pilots are also talking with navigators. They're also talking with video engineers. They're also talking with the scientists and they're all working together as a team to be able to maneuver the large boat and also all of these different submersibles, right? All of these different remotely operated vehicles. And here's kind of an inside area of where they work, right? So maybe you don't want to get some of that hot, co hot cocoa too close to some of those controls, right? Fortunately, you have a nice sippy mugs that really kind of keep it in place so that way it doesn't spill. But basically, this is the control room where a lot of that magic happens. Here are some of the joysticks that are used for some of those ROV pilots, which is really cool. Then you have a whole bunch of different screens that are used. And here are some other components too, right? Just that was just a close up real quick. So there's lots of different ways that you can use um, to be able to use different machines to be able to take pictures. And it's all thanks to those, uh, those staff that work together 
to make those images happen. It's also, if you ever watch any kind of like deep sea documentary, that's also how they get a lot of their images too. A lot of ROVs working in tandem with each other to get some of that beautiful footage. And here we have an example of one of those ROVs out too. Um, this is courtesy of our NOAA Office of Ocean Exploration and Research. So um, we also got another question of why aren't, oh, no, answer that one, sorry about that. Um, how does climate change affect the deep sea? And that's a really good question. Now, that's also can be quite complex, but if we think about our oceans and climate change, um, well, let's, let's first start with climate change, right? How does climate change occur? Well, it's basically all of the extra carbon dioxide that's being produced by a lot of fossil fuels, right? So um, coal, gas, et cetera, right? All of those are basically creating an excess of carbon dioxide, right? A rampant, a large amount of carbon dioxide that's going up into our atmosphere. Now, once it's in our atmosphere, it basically gets trapped and acts like a heat trapping blanket, meaning that basically all of that carbon dioxide is just stuck within our atmosphere. Now, if you think about if you're in a blanket, right? You're nice and warm and toasty. And if you're too hot, you can just kick it off, right? You can take it off. But our planet can't do that. So all of that heat is within our, our Earth. And from there, well, some of that heat gets transferred down into our oceans, uh, but also some of that carbon dioxide also gets transferred into our ocean waters too. So we have two things that are happening. We have our oceans that are warming, and then we also have extra carbon dioxide, which is therefore like acidifying our oceans meaning that we're kind of changing the natural balance of chemistry that's found within our waters. Now there's a whole set of slew of, uh, of effects that are happening from that, but a lot of it has to do with the animals that have what we like to call a calcium carbonate skeleton. So things like our urchins right here, uh, that crab that we saw, right? All of those animals that have hard shells and that have to draw a lot of calcium from the water to build these shells, well, when the pH is a little bit higher, it makes it a little bit trickier for them to access that calcium. And sometimes if they're, uh, a lot of organisms use calcium as kind of the building blocks of their skeletons when they're babies, well, then sometimes they don't end up surviving. So it's really kind of a, a tricky battle, right? Alternatively, um, we have the oceans that are, that are warming too. Now for the deep sea, right, they have little pockets of warming here and there, but really, I think scientists are still wondering and still are working on what are some of those changes. Now, just because it's deep doesn't necessarily mean that's not going to be affected by climate change. But scientists are still trying to figure out what exactly does that look like? How are there changes, right? So a lot of our deep sea has still yet to be explored. And they're working on getting what's called baseline data. So they're working on trying to see what does it look like now? And how does that change over time, right? And how does climate change affect that? Now, even things like tides, where the moon and the gravitational pull bring up water up and down our beaches, tides are even affecting, or that gravity of the moon is even affecting in the deep ocean too. So our deep sea is not necessarily an untouched environment, even though it is so far down, and we still have yet to know more about it. So hopefully that at least gives you a small glimpse into some of the, the trials and trickinesses um, and mysteries still of our deep sea in regards to climate change. Uh, we also got a question of how do people study bioluminescent fish in the ocean deep, right? So we touched a little bit upon that, uh, looking at some of those either submersibles where you could have people inside, or you could have um, those ROVs, those remotely operated vehicles, to kind of dive down to be able to see some of those fish. Now, of course, that's just seeing those fish. What if you wanted to like see it in real life, right, and be able to look at it and do tests or make measurements? Well, you can do that, make measurements just by looking at it, but you can also suck that animal up. Mm -hmm. Yep, there are things like little vacuums that uh, can be found on these ROVs, and they basically use an ROV like suction hose, and they will suck them all up, and then they will put them into a container uh, that's pressurized with lots of seawater that looks just like this. And so there's lots of different container options, and they're all labeled, which is very handy when you suck up a variety of organisms from the deep sea, right? So this is one way that you can go on ahead and study some of the animals that live down there and really get a collection and really get a chance to look at them up close to be able to study the, some of those deep sea fish. Now, Garcia is asking, um, are deep sea animals slow moving? Well, 
They can be, like these corals right here, right? They are easily picked up by this arm right here, and they're brought into a little bucket, which is another way that you could collect organisms, right? We talked about fish. Um, also, like gelatinous animals, also great at just being vacuum suctioned, right? But if you want things like rocks, right? Maybe you're setting those hydrothermal vents and you want a piece of that rock to see what the chemical makeup of it is. Or maybe it's a little bit larger, right? You can go on ahead and you can just take a piece of that, carefully and responsibly, of course, then you could put it in that little drawer and bring it back up, right? Or you can take different, well, samples while you're out there. So like, for instance, this is taking a temperature of a seep right here. So these are weaker vents where there is still some of that, um, that mixing that's going on where the water's warm, but it's just not at the same volume or the same heat level. So here we have a little temperature wand that's getting a chance to, to take a sample of that, right? So you don't even need to take samples of actual physical things like fish and rocks. Maybe you want to take a temperature of something or an area, right? Get a chance to see what kind of environment maybe those corals are that you want to grab a piece of. So. Um, it, yeah, it really kind of depends. That's a good question. So now not all animals are slow moving. Some of them can be a little bit faster if they need to be. But on average, these animals are pretty much going to be a bit slower as they just kind of, well, not wanting to exert a whole lot of energy if they don't have to, right? That takes energy to move really fast. And if there's not a lot of food out there, then they kind of pick and choose when they want to move a little bit quicker. Um, now, we did get a question of, are there deep sea illnesses? And that is a really good question that I don't have the answer to. I don't know if my friend Talia can go on ahead and look into that for me, right? Um, I'll, I'll uh, lean on my crew a little bit here. But to my knowledge, I don't know of any. But that's not to say if there aren't any. Um, it's just I personally am not aware of, of any at the moment. But that is a good question. We may get back to you on that one. Now, Xander is asking, how does the oxygen get to the deep sea? Ah, that is a good question because there's not a ton of it that is down there, right? Um, and so a lot of that goes through the process of diffusion, meaning that eventually some of these particles, there may be more in one area and less in another. And so those kind of air molecules may slowly move down. So that's one way that they might get oxygen. Um, alternatively, they just might use the chemicals to be able to, to do that instead and to really kind of be able to survive. Now, a lot of the oxygen that's brought into the ocean happens due to a lot of uh, wave action or storm action, right? Maybe there's a lot of churning of water and that brings in a lot of extra oxygen that way. Um, or waves crashing is another way, right? Or just natural uh, atmosphere into the, into the water. But as it gets deeper, it definitely, there definitely is a lot less oxygen than previously. Yeah, and also the algae, too, are also a great point. Thank you, Stacey. I almost, they're my favorites out of all things, and I almost forgot about them. Forgive me, algae, right? But a lot of the algae and the plants and the seagrasses that we were mentioning earlier that need that sunlight to grow uh, and what we like to call the photic zone where the light is, right? They also provide most of the oxygen that we breathe here on Earth, too. So, uh, you know, they're, they're a big component of that, too. But in the deep sea, it does get tricky, right? So that's definitely part of the limitations that they face. Oh my goodness, thank you so very much for all your questions, everyone. So here in the deep sea, right, there are a ton of different struggles. We had a chance to talk about, you know, food as struggle, um, looking a little bit about pressure as a struggle, thinking about, you know, maybe a little bit about the predators by getting a chance to look at that angler fish, right, and finding that it uses that bioluminescence to be able to use it as a lure. Alternatively, you know, maybe use it to kind of camouflage into the moonlight, like our, our Hawaiian bobtail squid. But there are more ways that we can actually utilize that bioluminescence. Now, Stacey went ahead and put up that, uh, that shrimp a bit ago, that really bright red shrimp. Now, as a matter of fact, that shrimp also uses bioluminescence too. Can you think of maybe how this shrimp uses bioluminescence? Well, I don't see any, you know, what we like to call photophores, so light cells basically on this animal right here because it is inside the animal. Mm -hmm. Now, not only do animals can use bioluminescence to be able to attract prey, but maybe they can use it to evade predators too. And this shrimp is a great example of that. They will spew out this bright blue substance right here, this bioluminescence. And because it is so dark down there, 
It's almost like being flashed by a bright light, you know, not really knowing where things are because it's so bright. Now, you personally may have experienced this if you woke up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom or maybe you wanted to eat some cake at 2 a.m. And you're, you know, you're slowly getting up and it's dark and you turn on the light and it's like, oh, so bright, so bright. But that cake or using the restroom is worth it. So, you know, you get temporarily blinded by that light. Well, kind of the same thing here. The shrimp is able to really, ha, ah, here's a beautiful time lapse, right? Um, the shrimp is really able to, well, put on that light and blind their predator so that way they can go on ahead and successfully survive. So today, we've had a chance to talk a lot about different ways in which animals are able to use bioluminescence and also some of the struggles and really cool habitats of this ecosystem. So I just want to say thank you so very much for joining us today. If you do have any further questions or, um, you know, anything that you'd like to tell us, you're always more than welcome to go on ahead and text us or email us down below. Now, teachers, for those of you that are watching, please make sure that you provide the number of students if possible. Uh, this just allows us to be able to kind of see what our audience is out there and and kind of prioritize programming as well. So I just want to say thank you so very much for joining us today. I hope you have a wonderful weekend.